All right. Well, hopefully uh, you uh, did a good job on page 195, numbers 3, 7, and 9, as we practice finding points of intersection. Again, how do we find points of intersection? Um, By using a system of equations. And so on page 195, number 3, we have the equation x squared positive 2y squared is equal to 48. What shape is that? Uh, ellipse. Ellipse. It's, a, it's like a circle, except because these numbers don't match, it's a distorted circle or an ellipse. And then uh, we also had x minus y equals 0. That, of course, being a straight line. So probably line, ellipse, probably two points. Could miss, could be tangent, could just be one. Um, as we solve here, uh, can I use the addition method? No. So we have to use substitution. What should we do? Uh, Jane? Um, we can Okay, so if y equals x or x equals y, then we can put y where it says x. So now it's y squared plus 2y squared equals 48. And then I um, combine like terms. I got 3y squared equals 48. Then divided and got y squared equals 16, which is positive and negative. All right, so two different ordinates here for my points of intersection. I'm going to get a point of intersection of 4, point of intersection at negative 4. Now we need to take the 4 and negative 4 and plug them into which equation, class? Um, the lower equation, the lowest power equation, which is essentially x equals y. Well, if x and y are the same thing, then if y is 4, x is. And if uh, y is negative 4, x is. So apparently, this straight line and this ellipse intersect at 4, 4, and negative 4, negative 4. Those are your two points of intersection. Questions on this? Do we have that for number 3? Excellent. Number seven, uh, we've got a y squared is equal to x plus three. Quentin, that is a uh, parabola. parabola. Good. And um, the uh, x squared plus four y squared, um, that is ellipse. An, an ellipse. So with a parabola and an ellipse, and if you picture this, right, you could get up towards a four points, couldn't you? You could get fewer than that, obviously. We get upwards of four points here. Um, can we solve using the addition method? You kind of maybe could, but it's a long shot. Here's my other thought. I've already got it that y squared is x plus three. I don't necessarily even have to solve substitute for a y. I could actually take x plus three and Right there where it says y squared. Didn't either of you do that? Mm -hmm. Now, the other option would be to move the 3 over as a negative and say that x is y squared minus 3 and plug that in here and then square that. But that's annoying, right? The easy route here is to say x squared plus 4 times x plus 3 and substitute for a y squared equals 9. I'm a big fan of the easy way. So it seems like we both saw that, did that excellent. It's going to be way easier than the other way. All right, so then we need to, Jamie? Just repeat and get 4x. Plus All right, then Quentin. All right, and unfortunately, this one will factor, right? So we're not stuck doing the formula or completing the square. Uh, but if we did have to use the formula, what's the quadratic formula class? For the record, uh, he was reading that out of his notes. Um, but it'd be good to have that memorized, wouldn't it? Let's say it together. <clears throat> x equals negative b plus or minus the square root of b squared minus 4ac all over 2a. <clears throat> Remember, you solve that first. Because if it comes out imaginary, you're off the hook. It factored, though. X plus one, x plus one. So we end up with two abscissas here. Okay. Negative 1 and positive 3 are the two abscissas. Now, we've got to plug these into the lowest power equation. What is the lowest power equation? The 
top because only one of them is squared, right? As opposed to going here where both of them are squared. So if I plug in the negative one for x, that's going to give me Yeah. Negative three. Was the did the equation have a negative three in it? No. Um, no how about it be negative three? Four x if it's. Oh, three. you said plus three. I'm sorry. Plus one, plus three. I, I misheard you. Positive one, positive three, negative three, and negative one. Okay, there we go. All right. Sorry about that. All right. So negative one is the first value we'll plug in though for my x, right? Yeah. Negative one plus three. Two. And then to take to get the y, we're gonna have to take the three. square root. That's gonna give me two square roots the square root of 2 and the negative square root of 2. Now that's okay. Those are values you can graph, right? Because square root of 2 as a decimal like 1.4. Right, 1.4. So it's not that you could not graph this. You just have to go backward 1, upward 1.4 and then down backward 1, downward 1.4. Do we see that? So you could graph those points. Um, and then when we plug in the negative 3, we get, zero. if you take the square root of 0, you just have zero. 0. So negative 3, 0 is another point of intersection where the ellipse and the um, parabola cross. So presumably the parabola is doing something like this, and the ellipse somehow... comes like that to where it's tangent on the inside here and then crosses at these two points. So that's kind of what we've got going on here. Questions on that? All right, did we get those points? Negative one squared two, negative one negative squared two, and negative three zero? All right, and number nine from the homework. And uh, y squared equals x plus two plus, what is that? Uh, parabola. parabola, y squared equals two x. Another parabola. So at most, how many points could, could two parabolae, <laughs> parabolas, cross each other? Two. I'm only getting, yeah, I'm only picturing two. Um, I don't see a way to get them to cross four times. Maybe three, possibly? No, no, because if they shared a vertex, that wouldn't work, because then they wouldn't, yeah, they wouldn't cross a second time. So I'm getting probably two points of intersection is my guess. Possibly one, possibly none. I don't think more than two. Um, question, what do we do to start? To get? Yeah. Just take the 2x and put it here where it says y squared, and then it's really easy to solve. We end up getting class equals 2. And if x equals 2, we're going to plug that 2 into either equation. Either way, 2 plus 2 or 2 times 2 class gives us 4. We take the square root of 4, we get positive and negative 2. So the same at ordinate 2 gives us two abscissas, so two points of intersection. So our two parabolas, um, the one, let's see here. So I think it's going to be, let's see, symmetric to the x-axis. So we've got one that's going to be something like this, and the other is going to be something like this. And they're going to intersect at 2, 2, and 2, negative 2. And uh, there's our two points of intersection. Questions on, these are not drawn particularly well, by the way. Uh, questions on number nine, did we get those two points? All right, any questions at all on systems of equations, finding points of intersection? Then let's move on to the next section in your notes now, parametric equations. Parametric equations. What's the root word of parametric? Well, that's a prefix. Um, uh, that's actually got us up. How about parameter? Right? Ick means like pertaining to, so like or pertaining to a parameter. Now, parameter also, of course, has your para, which means beside or alongside. Um, what are parameters? Have you heard that term before? Parameters? Maybe, maybe you've heard of them in these terms. Maybe 
you know, your friends want to hang out or do something or whatever, like, hey, you can, but here's the parameters. You're not going to stay out past this time. You're not going to go here. You're going to make sure that so-and-so doesn't drive, whatever, right? Um, but uh, they set parameters, right? Or guidelines. A parameter is kind of a guideline. It's, it's, it's in a sense, it's a restriction, isn't it? It's, okay, you've got this freedom. I'm going to let you do this, but I don't want you to do this, 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 this. These are the guidelines or the restrictions by which you're permitted to proceed. Does that make sense? A parameter is a limitation, if you will. Parametric equations that are equations that have a limitation on them. Here's your definition. It's a pair of equations with x and y. A pair of equations, so kind of like a system of equations, right? A pair of equations with x and y defined in terms of a third variable. A pair of equations with x and y defined in terms of a third variable. So instead of x and y defined in terms of each other, x is defined in terms of some other letter, y is defined in terms of that other letter. In parentheses, that third variable is called the parameter, spelled as you would expect, parameter. Okay, so a pair of equations in which x and y are defined in terms of a third variable called the parameter, which serves as a limiter. Pair of equations with x and y defined in terms of a third variable called the parameter, which serves as a limiter. The point of the parameter is to limit. Here's the idea. If I draw a parabola, you could see how a parabola could make a really cool like roller coaster design, right? Unless it goes down to infinity, because you can't have an infinitely big roller coaster. A full parabola does you no good. A limited parabola, however, could, right? For instance, maybe you would take this parabola and you would take that parabola and you would limit from here to here and you would take this one, you'd limit it from here to here so that when you put them together, Da, 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 whoom, right? And then maybe you need to take another curve and put it there. Do you see how you could piece pieces together if you could limit? A full parabola doesn't really help you, right? Any more than, you know, for instance, a full sine curve or anything like that. But if you could limit just to pieces or parts, and that's where the parameter comes in. It serves to limit. Uh, write this system down in your notes as an example. Let's suppose we said that x is equal to 2t, and suppose we said that y is equal to 4t minus t squared. Do you see the third variable? It's the letter t. x is defined in terms of t, y is defined in terms of t. What we're going to do is we're going to say that t then is limited between, uh, let's say, um, <clears throat> 0 and 4. Let's limit the t between 0 and 4. Do you realize that by limiting the t, we are now limiting what kind of values we can get out for x? By limiting the domain, inherently, we are limiting the range that we get out from the x. By limiting the t, we're limiting what we can get out for y. So instead of limitless curves, we get structured curves that fall within certain boundaries. That's the use of the parameter. So how then do we graph parametric equations? Well, step number one, you want to set up a TXY table. I use T because T or time is often a limiting factor, often a parameter. It's not the only parameter though, but uh, you know, we use whatever else. TXY table, or that is a table that uses the parameter and then X and Y. We'll set up a TXY table. Step number two, plug in all integer values for T. Plug in all the values you're allowed to have for the parameter first. So I like to go with just integers, 0, 1, 2, 3, and 4. Are fractions allowed? Of course they are, but I'm lazy. I don't like fractions. Now, if it was limited between 0 and 2, 0, 1, and 2, that's not a whole lot of points, right? So maybe there I dive into, the, okay, what about a half and one and a half, just to get a few more points to help me flesh out the curve. But five points, that should be enough. Step number three, after we filled in all of our integer values, calculate x and y based on the parameter. Calculate x and y based on the parameter. 
So x we see is simply double the parameter, right? So if my parameter is 0, 1, 2, 3, 4, what are the x values that would correspond with those parameter values? Now let's find the y values. A little bit trickier because we have to multiply 4 times the value minus the square of the parameter. If we plugged in zeros here, what do we get? Zero. Zero. If we plug in ones right here, what do we get? Three. If we plug in twos right here, what do we get? Four. Four. Hunter, feel free to jump in here. If we plug in three, what do we get? Three. Three. And if I plug in four right here, what do I get? Zero. Zero. So we finished filling in our TXY table. Now here's the key. The parameter is a limiter. That's all it's there for. It doesn't get graphed, right? So step number four is graph only the XY coordinates. The parameter has done its job. So graph only the XY coordinates. You do not graph the parameter. So if we were to graph this, and I'm not going to take time to get out the graph paper right now, though we will in a little bit. But if I were to graph this for sake of illustration, 0, 0 is my first point. Again, we're ignoring the t column completely. 2, 3 is the next point. So 2, 3 would be right about here. 4, 4. 6, 3. 8, 0. I'm kind of running out of room here. Right? And when we connect these points with a smooth, continuous curve, do you see what shape we've got? It's a parabola, or at least it's part of a parabola, right? We talked about projectiles in physics, right? Maybe this is the path by which a, um, a mortar shell is launched, or a rocket is launched, or maybe a baseball is thrown. Well, a baseball's not going to get down into the ground. That's silly, right? Nor is it going to, I mean, if it's a mortar shell, it might penetrate the ground a little bit, right? But it's not going to go like infinitely down into the ground. That, that's, that's ridiculous. We've limited to what's actually realistic here through the, use of, through the use of the parameter. Instead of a limitless parabola, it is now limited by the parameters. Does that make sense on the parametric equations? Okay, that's at its most basic. Now, there's some really cool things we can do with parametric equations, but it's kind of a basic introduction as we get started. We feel like we understand the concept, at least, before we get to fun. All right, so let's go with uh, this now at your seats and go ahead and get out a sheet of graph paper. On your graph paper, go ahead and set up a Cartesian plane. And let's do an actual graph of a pair of parametric equations. The graph grid is not showing up. Great. Let me zoom in a little bit to try to help that out what it's worth. Um, all right, so uh, this time let's use the letter P for the parameter, shall we? And let's suppose that uh, X is equal to 3P, and suppose that Y is equal to 2P plus 8. Obviously, we need a limitation put on the parameter. And that limitation on the parameter will therefore limit the x and the y. Let's suppose the parameter this time is limited between negative 4 and 0. Say the parameter is limited between negative 4 and 0. What do we do? Make your chart. This time, because instead of T, it's P. Big deal. We treat it the same way. All right, then what, Jamie? Um, we list what the possible values, so negative 4, negative 3, negative 4, and 0. There we go. Again, if you wanted to do fractions, you certainly could. I just don't want to. All right, then let's fill in the X column, Jamie. Um, so we like. 
Oh, on the default. Then negative nine. Negative six. And negative zero. And zero. There we go. We're just tripling all of the p values. Now, one thing I do notice is if I've got an x value of negative 12, maybe I should have waited a second my Cartesian plane. Um, I'm going to need a little bit more room out here, right? So this is negative 9, 10, 11, negative 12. All right, and now the y column, Quentin. Y looks good. It goes up to eight. All right, and then we just uh, we plug in uh, we plot the points. What's the first point we are going to plot, Jamie? Um, negative plus zero. Good. Remember, you're, if you want to just scribble out the parameter column before you try graphing, just to make sure it doesn't throw you off, negative twelve zero is the first uh, point that we need to plot. So negative twelve zero right here on the negative x axis. All right, then uh, Quentin. Negative nine two. Negative nine two. All right, Jamie? Um, then negative six, four. Negative six, four. All right, Quentin? Uh, negative three, six. Negative three, six, and then finally, Jamie? Um, zero, eight. Zero, eight. What shape does this appear to be? Line. It appears to be a straight line, doesn't it? And in fact, if you, you could use a straight edge to connect all these points together, and you get a straight line. But remember, we've said before, a line goes to infinity. This is a line segment. It does not extend further. It would be wrong. Remember when we were younger, drawing linear equations, that make sure you go as nice and big, end to end of the graph. Do not do that here. Only stay between these end points that are dictated to us by the parameter. Does that make sense? So it's a limited line now. Um, write this one down. Let's take um, x equals k squared and y equals k plus 3. And let's limit k between negative 3 and 3. You can use the same graph grid, I suppose, that you just had a moment ago. Maybe use a pen instead of a pencil or a different color of ink or a pencil instead of a pen just to show the contrast. I'll go with yellow chalk here.
indent these, what do we end up with? Part of a parabola, right? Just just the, uh, the the main part here that we would think of, right? It doesn't extend infinitely. Well, again, imagine if you're designing, for instance, um, I don't know, maybe like a, a rocket of some kind, right? You don't need an infinitely long parabolic nose cone, but imagine if you just took this shape, spun it around in three dimensions. Well, that would give you maybe a really nice shape for a nose cone that you can then put on the rest of the, of the cylinder, for instance, that would extend the rest of the way, right? So again, the use of parametric equations is in engineering, certainly where you can mathematically design something and tell the computer how to run the machines that do, put everything together. So yeah, the limiting power of the, of the parameter, very powerful. Uh, let's look at some fun parametric equations. I'll, I'll use that term. Does that sound like a good term? Sounds nice and harmless. Let's go with that term. Uh, some fun parametric equations on page 196. Again, we see here a uh, rather flattened parabola, just the end of it, right, where it uh, has the curvature. Uh, but again, limited in that respect. Uh, we look at the next page. They actually use sine and cosine together to make a perfectly straight line segment running between negative one or between one and one. Uh, we turn the page, and of course we see what that line would have looked like without the limitation, right? Without the parameter restriction, of course it's just a full straight line. Then they get into uh, the Schrodinger wave model, how you could actually use parametric equations using trig functions to actually describe that wavy pattern that an electron would go around the nucleus. Um, we kind of see that uh, Trans, uh, translated on another curve, very similar there, but without four waves, just three waves, um, on the top of page 199. Uh, we see the involute of a circle. That's one I think we're going to get to draw here in a little bit, but uh, it would be imagine if you uh, were unscrolling a piece of string, right? It would get bigger and bigger as you went further and further out. That's something that can be described using trig functions in a parametric equation. The cycloid curve, I think, is kind of interesting. If you pictured a point on a bicycle wheel as it rolled along the ground, the point would go down. As it's moving forward, it would also go down to the ground, but then it would come right back up again, wouldn't it? It would never go below the ground. It almost looks like, you know, like a series of parabolas, but it's not. It's called a cycloid curve. Uh, we're going to graph a hypercycloid here in a little bit. Um, Again, you can kind of see some projectile motion mentioned there as well. Um, basically, anything that involves a trig function has the potential to get really interesting. So if we use theta as the parameter, instead of a random thing like k or p or t, if we use theta as our parameter, then we can produce some really interesting results. Let's take a look at number 15. Let's start with a fairly basic parametric equation. And for this, instead of a kxy or a txy or a pxy table, we're going to use a theta xy table as we do number 15 on page 201. So let's take a look at the equations first of all. We have uh, our x equation. x here is listed as being equal to cosine of theta minus 1. And then y is equal to 2 times the sine of theta. And the limitation on theta is that theta has to be between 0 degrees and 360 degrees. Now, I'm not going to do all my integer values here, right? That would be a little foolish, right? 1 degree, 2 degrees, 3 degrees, 4 degrees, 5. But maybe we could take um, maybe increments of 30 degrees, for instance. And that would uh, still give us a lot of points we could use without you know, going overboard. So let's set up a theta xy table. But for me, theta xy running down the chalkboard is going to be a little hard because my chalkboard is not. It's longer than it is wide. You may want to go ahead and go down the page theta xy. I'm going to go theta xy. I'm going to go sideways. It just gives me a little bit more space here. All right, so if we're going to do every 30 degrees, starting with 0, ending with 360, then obviously my first theta has to be 0, zero degrees. Then 30, 60, you're doing this on your paper with me, 90, 90 120, 
amount of room here. 300, 330, and we'll finally end with 360. All right, lovely. It did include 360, right? Yeah, plus the grid. Zero is less than or equal to theta, less than or equal to 360 degrees. All right. Okay, uh, well, calculator's ready. Let's fill in all of our x's first. I think that'll be easiest. Let's take the cosine of the angle and then minus one. So zero cosine, minus one. Or if you have direct entry, cosine zero, minus one. Make sure it's in degree mode. All right, do the same thing for 30. Cosine 30 minus one. Zero again? Oh. It's going to be a weird decimal, yeah. Okay, negative point one three three nine. Negative point one three three. Mm -hmm. Let's just say negative point one. We're not going to be able to plot negative point one three that accurately anyway. So let's say negative one. All right, sixty. Negative point five. Negative point five. That come out evenly. Mm -hmm. All right, that's not bad. Neg uh, Ninety. All right, 120. Hmm, 150. Negative 1.86, let's say negative 1.9. All right, 180. Negative 2.9. Negative 2. Negative 2. All right, 210. All right, 240. Ah, okay, now I'm starting to see a pattern. Quentin said a moment ago, I see a pattern. I'm glad he's looking for it. I didn't see it yet, but I see it now. Do you see it? All right, what do you think the next value should be? Negative one. Negative one. Then what do you think the next one will be? Negative All right, the next one? Negative And then... All right, now let's fact check ourselves. Let's just make sure we weren't hasty here. Um, one of you do 270 and let's do 330. So do 270, you do 330. Let's just make sure we're right. Yes. And with parametric equations, particularly involving theta, you're going to get patterns. So we'll look for them. Let's do y now. We're gonna double the sign. So take the sign of zero and then times two. Zero. All right, sine of 30. And then once you get the sine of 30, then times two. Careful, I do 30 times two. We're not taking the sine of 60. One. We're doubling the sine of 30. One. One. All right, then we're going to double the sine of 60. Double the sine of 90. Two. All right, double the sine of 120. 1.7. Ah, we see a pattern. What are the next two numbers? Uh. One. And then zero. zero. I don't know about the 210 though. So let's try the 210. Negative one. Negative one. I've got a hunch. My hunch is negative 1.7. Yeah. But let's check it. Let's do 240 and just make sure, because I could be wrong. Negative 1.7. Okay, so what do we think the next number is going to be then? Negative two. And then. And then, one. oh, careful. Uh, negative, one. negative one and then zero. zero. All right, well, let's fact check the 270 again and the 330 again, just to make sure we're not uh, leaping to conclusions that don't exist. Yes. Mm -hmm. All right, so again, patterns are going to be there for you. Let me uh, try to make this a little easier for the camera to read, theoretically. Um, <laughs> I uh, clearing that off. Go ahead and set up a graph grid. But notice on your graph grid, all of my x's are negative. That means everything's going to be on the left-hand side of the axis, right? So I don't need to put my, um, my x-axis down the middle. Now my y's are kind of up and down, correct? So I'm going to need to make sure as I set up my Cartesian plane here that I give myself plenty of room up and down on both sides, but uh, I'm going to kind of shift the y-axis over a little bit 
so I favor the um, favor the left hand side. So there's my y. There's my x. We see I'm giving myself more room this direction. But here's the other thing. My biggest number, absolute value, is what? Two. Two. That's it. So why don't I go like, take a few boxes to get to one, and then a few more boxes to get to two. So if I do like four boxes is one, then eight boxes would be two. So negative one, negative two. This will allow me to graph with more accuracy, won't it? Because now two boxes is the half. And if I wanted to do this 0.13 or whatever it was, or 1.7, I can be a little bit more accurate with it, can't I? It helps if I could draw a straight x-axis. My x-axis has scoliosis. All right. <laughs> All right. Uh, so we're going to start by plotting our first point. Zero, zero. Then my next point is going to be backward 0.13. Now, again, this would be 0.5, right? This would be 0.25. So 0.13 would be about halfway back a box. If I do every four boxes for one, about half a box back, and then I need to go up to one, which is four boxes. So my next point is going to be right here. Follow? All right, my next point is going to go backward 0.5, negative 0.5. That's two boxes, though. And then I'm going to go up 1.7. Well, remember, this is 1. This is 2. This is 1 and a half. 1.7, this would be 1 and 3 fourths, 1.75. I'll be really close to that. So I'm going to be just under this. Do you see how we can graph with accuracy as we stretch out our units? All right. The next point's easy, negative one, two. So go back four boxes, up eight boxes. And we got negative 1.5. And then there's that 1.7 again. Negative 1.9. Again, this is one and three fourths. One point nine is going to be about halfway, maybe even a little more than halfway to the negative two box, um, and then up one, something-ish like that, and finally negative two zero. So far, what does it look like we've got going on here? Looks like we've got this parabola, right? All right. Let's keep going. Then we're going to go negative 1.9 again, and this time down 1. Which is four boxes, remember? Okay, well, there is the parabola. Um, <laughs> let's see, then we've got a negative 1.5, that's six boxes, down to 1.7. And negative one, negative two, negative half, negative 1.7, negative 0.13, negative one, and then back to zero, zero. It's an ellipse. Might be easiest if you start at the top and come down to these sides. graph there. Okay, so again, it started looking like a parabola, but it kind of closes back up, so we get a full ellipse there. Now, how could we have gotten just the half ellipse if we'd set this to go to 180, right? We never would have graphed the bottom half, and then we just get the top half of the ellipse, so we can limit wherever we want. Um, 
Let's see. I think we're going to have to save some of the, some more of the fun ones for tomorrow. So no, I'll give you one fun one tonight. One fun one tonight, yeah. Let's do that. Page 201. Page 201. I want you to do numbers 9, 10, and 12. Page 201, numbers 9, 10, and 12. All right, we are looking at probably test coming up lesson 115, which will be Tuesday for you guys. Lesson 115 is what we're looking at for our test over chapters 9 and 10. And uh, as we get closer, I'll know for sure, but probably less than 115. All right, again, homework, page 201, numbers 9, 10, and 12. Tomorrow we'll do some more of these parametric equations and see how we do with those. All right, you are dismissed. Have a wonderful rest of your day.